welcome to this first video on probability for the uh, S1 syllabus for the Cambridge International Exams for the AS Maths. Probability is the third chapter in the workbook. Um, here's the syllabus you see. Students should be able to evaluate probabilities in simple cases by means of enumeration of equiprobable elementary events. And there's some big words there. Um, e.g. for the total score when two fair dice are thrown or by calculation using permutations or combinations. Alright, use addition or multiplication of probabilities as appropriate in simple cases and understand the meaning of exclusive and independent events and calculate and use conditional probabilities in simple cases. E.g. situations that can be represented by means of a tree diagram. Okay, so there's a few things that we're going to look at in this video, kind of covering the first and the second bullet point definitions and simple probability. So here's some basic definitions, some words that you probably have already come across. So just a reminder, we're doing experiments such as throwing a pair of dice. One performance of the experiment is called a trial. Uh, the outcome is the result of the trial. The sample space is the set of all possible outcomes. We're going to talk about sample space in this video. And an event is a subset of the sample space, such as scoring an odd number when we roll two dice, when we're scoring an odd total. Okay, <clears throat> there's two branches of probability, experimental and theoretical. Experimental probabilities, uh, you know, we're doing experiments, we're, say, tossing a, a, a pin and counting the number of times it lands pin up or pin down. Uh, but in this case, we're going to deal with uh, theoretical probability, really. So here's the formula for theoretical probability. The number of ways an event can occur divided by the total number of ways. So P of A, you're going to see this a lot, is said the probability of A. Some definitions here. Intersection. You will have seen this in sets in IGCSE. The intersection of two events is that area there. It's said probability of A and B, it's the upside down U thing here, probability of A intersection B. Mutually exclusive means that the two events do not have an intersection. So the definition of mutually exclusive is the probability of A and B happening is zero. Slightly trickier one, independent. Independent means that the two events do not influence each other. And if two events are independent, then if you want to find the probability of both happening, we just multiply their individual probabilities. That's a very important idea right there. And that's the way that you prove two events are independent. That formula there. The union of two events is one or the other. Or both. So it's that shaded area there. So it's A union B means A or B. It's written with a U in between them, which is good. And here's the formula, which I'm going to show you how it works later on. A union B. Complementary is another word that you need to know. The complement of event is just the probability of the event not happening. So if event A was the event that it rains today, A dash would be the event that it doesn't rain today. Example, a single fair die is rolled. Fair means that it has equally likely chance of coming up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or 6. Event A is getting an odd number and B is rolling a prime number. Okay, so let's write these out. So A, odd numbers, 1, 3, and 5. B, the prime numbers, 2, 3, and 5. We can put them in our Venn diagram so it looks like this. So the, the outcomes that are in both A and B are 3 and 5. Okay, so the probability of getting A and B is 2 outcomes out of 6 or 1 third. So the answer to B, probably A intersection B, is one-third. The probability of A union B. Well, we could look at our Venn diagram and add these three probabilities together. One-six plus one-third plus one-six, which would give us two-thirds. Or we could use the formula. The probability of A or B is the probability of A plus B minus the intersection. So a half plus a half minus a third. Are they independent? There's only one way to try. What to tell? The probability of A in section B we've worked out, that's one third. The probability of A is a half, the probability of B is a half. Put that in the formula. 
since one third is not a half times a half, half times a half is a quarter, A and B are not independent. Are they mutually exclusive? Well, the intersection is clearly not zero. The intersection is a third, so they are not mutually exclusive. Another way that we look at probability is by drawing out what we call the sample space. So here's a really basic problem that you would have seen last year, rolling two dice now, adding them together, and we want to know the probability of getting a total of seven. Okay, we could start to list them out and think about it. We could get one on the first die and six on the second uh, and start to list them out. It's much easier to draw a diagram and look at what we call the sample space. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got the first dice, the second dice, and we're adding together all of the different outcomes. So there we go, there's our sample space. There is 36 different outcomes, and each one of these outcomes is equally likely. So what's the probability of getting a seven? We can now count the number of sevens. There is one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes that give us a total of seven. So six divided by 36 simplifies to one-sixth. Probability of getting a seven, a total of seven, is one-sixth. Here is another problem where we're not adding the two dice together, we're actually multiplying the two numbers. So we could do a similar thing here, write out the sample space of when we multiply the two numbers together. And there we go, there's our 36 different outcomes. What's the probability of scoring 12 or more? Okay, so let's identify in our table there the values that are 12 or more. If we count them all up, there's 17 outcomes out of the 36 that are 12 or more. So that's another example of using the sample space to get the probability. In this example, we've got two fair tetrahedral dice. So they're dice with four sides, not labeled one, two, three, four, but labeled one, one, three, four. So just a little bit of a twist there. And we're gonna roll them both and add the numbers together. So here's the sample space. First dice, second dice, and we're adding them together in each case to get all the numbers. You can see there's now 16 different possible outcomes. Each one is equally likely. So let's answer the question now. Once we've got the sample space, it's easy. Find the probability that the total is four. I can see one, two, three, four times four appears. So four out of 16 or one quarter. What's the probability that the total of the two dice is more than four? So more than four doesn't include four, so five and above. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight out of the 16, so the probabilities are half. The probability that is less than seven, okay, less than seven, so that would be everything but these three here. So we've got 13 out of the 16 that are less than seven. And in E, both dice show the same number. All right, so we need to look a little bit closer here. Uh, certainly one, one here, one, one here, one, all of these four here are gonna show the same number. Three and three here, four and four here. So if we count them all up, looks like that we've got six out of the 16 showing the same number. So three eighths. You can write these as decimals, but I think it's nicer here to just write it as a fraction and leave your answer as a fraction. Okay, got two events for F, getting a four on the first dice and getting a total of eight. Are they independent? Are they mutually exclusive? Okay, don't go with your gut instinct. It's not about gut instinct. You've got to go with the probability formula that I showed you before. And here it is here. If they're independent, then this is true. Okay, so let's look at the left-hand side of this equation. What's the probability that the first dice is a four and we get a total of eight? So the first dice is a four and we get a total of eight. There we go, one out of 16. So the probability of A and B happening is one out of 16. Okay, the probability of A getting a four on the first dice is clearly one out of four. We've got a one quarter chance just looking at the, rolling the first dice. What's the probability of getting a total of eight? Looking at our table now, there's a one out of 16 chance of getting a total of eight. Okay, put all that together. Does 1 16th equal 1 quarter times 1 16th? No. Therefore, the events are not independent. In fact, you can't get a total of 8 
unless you get a four on the first dice. So clearly these two events are not independent. Clearly the second event happening depends on the first one happening. So definitely not independent. In answer to the second one, uh, probability of A intersection B is not zero, so the events are not mutually exclusive. Last example here, we've got a table where we've asked 100 people about their smoking habits. Uh, you may have seen these also last year. What's the probability the person chosen at random is a smoker? So if I just add on some extra columns here and get some totals. Okay, so we choose a person out at random. What's the probability, probability they're a smoker? Well, 65 out of the 100 were smokers. So 65 out of 100 or 0.65. Probably the person chosen is a female. 40 out of the 100 people were females, so 0.4. The probability that a person chosen at random is a female smoker, 30 out of the 100, so 0.3. So are these two events independent, being a smoker and being a female? Once again, don't go on gut instinct. The probability that someone is a smoker and a female is 0.3. Probably they're a smoker is 0.65. Probably they're a female is 0.4. If they were independent, this would equal this times this. But if you do the sum on the right, you'll find that that's not true. So these two events are not independent. Mm -hmm.